Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every Sunday night, I'll try to get to as many questions as possible. But first, I want to say hi to you, mom and dad. Oh, there. Dr. McDougal, Mary, how are you? Yeah, we're, we're good. We had a nice one. Nice so I know you have, you have, you emailed me, Dad, and you have a ton of studies that you want to go through. And I think that's so great to start these hours off with the latest research and what's going on in the news. So let's get started. No, we'll try, we'll try this format for a while, Heather, <clears throat> because there, there are, we, we have a following that uh, hears the answers to the questions more than once. And they've just, they're pretty <laughs> much tired of it. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and start out every Sunday night session with uh, some of the things that have kind of excited me for the week. And, um, you know, I, I read a lot. I read several newspapers and uh, I read about 13 journals every week. And <laughs> yeah. So what, what, I, what I'd what i like to do is I'd like to um, tell you about some of the things that excited me over the week, the past week. And this is the week of uh, October what, 9th, 2023. Yeah, it's amazing how much information comes out in just one week. Okay, uh, I start out in the morning with the Oregonian newspaper. And uh, believe me, it doesn't have too much in it, too exciting. But <laughs> quickly, I, I'll go into uh, USA Today, which is uh, almost a comic strip as far as the news is concerned, then move over to the New York Times. And uh, interesting, the New York Times this week, October 4th, 2023, had an article about uh, eosinophilia esophagitis, okay? And, and this is a, a new horror they talk about. Eosinophilia, that means that when you look under the microscope, you see eosinophils, which are kind of red, kind of, kind of a red hue to them, the white blood cells too. And these are produced as a consequence of allergy. All right, well, the first thing that I would look at if somebody had this particular condition of an inflamed esophagus, esophagitis, and when you took a look at the mucus, they you stuck a, a, some type of instrument down into the esophagus and you pulled some of the mucus out of the esophagus, you look at the white blood cells. I mean, the, the mucus is made up of a lot of white blood cells. You see a whole bunch of eosinophils and the, the esophagus inflamed, you're in pain, you're worried, you're, not, you know, you're losing weight. Anyway, don't you think the most obvious place to look would be at the things you put in the esophagus? You know, this is the <laughs> tube that goes from the mouth to the stomach. I would think so. Yeah. Well, it, they didn't I'm really. I'm sure that's not the case, though. Well, they didn't mention it. They gave you a whole bunch of excuses as to why you might have it, and there's no way of getting over it. <laughs> but anyway, um, you, you'd look at the esophagus to see what's coming in contact with the esophagus. You would. Uh, uh, then consider this an allergic reaction. The allergic reaction is where the body uh, causes a defensive response against think something it thinks is toxic, poisonous, damaging. So um, the most common food that causes allergic reactions is dairy. So uh, I would I would certainly start this person out with a healthy diet. Devoid of dairy, starch based with fruits and vegetables. And then I would go on to, to look at other things that are related to allergy, autoimmune diseases included. And these would be these would be uh, problems of gluten. Well, gluten, wheat, barley, and rye. It's a it's a, a sugar protein, a glycoprotein that's pro, that's really predominant in wheat, barley, and rye, and it causes people to have a leaky gut more autoimmune diseases, uh, weight loss, uh, chronic diarrhea, you know, all kinds of problems of malabsorption. Why, why would someone, um, I don't know, examine that well, this part is, of their, their esophagus to see, or would, would they be having pain? or They'd be in discomfort, and they'd go see a gastroenterologist. Okay. And the gastroenterologist would take this tube, you know, it's about three, four feet long, it's called a gastroscope. And they'd look in and they'd take samples of the of the tissues in the esophagus. Yeah, so it'd be, it'd be pain. It'd be one a, made just one no. pain once in a while. It'd be something. Oh, well, this would be some, somebody that had seen several general practitioners and then went to see a specialist to get more and more definitive diagnosis. But unfortunately, you know, something as obvious as the food you put in the body, the food you put in the esophagus, might be something to look at. 
when it comes to the cause of disease. But the un unfortunate thing, when you go to medical school or residency training, you learn you learn nothing about diet. Um, you look, you learn about immune suppressant drugs, which is what you would treat somebody like this when you put them on steroids or one of the other new fancy immune suppressive drugs that they advertise for everything from psoriasis to ulcerative <laughs> colitis. You know, that'll suppress the immune system. That'll relieve some of the symptoms, just like any of the auto other autoimmune diseases do with, uh, with problems of, uh, of autoimmune. You just give it a- oh, I love it. I just love it when one drug ad comes on and the, you know, 10 minutes later, the same yeah, ad the, comes the, on for another- Ulcerative disease. colitis, then Crohn's yeah. disease, then- uh, psoriatic arthritis, yeah. and then the next one, and they're all the same drug oh, yeah. because they suppress the immune system. And then they follow with an advertisement for the next oh, 90 seconds that tells you, because you don't have an adequate immune system anymore, because I gave you this poisonous medicine that suppresses the immune system, which costs you like between, you know, on your insurance company, between ten and $70,000 a year just for the drug. <clears throat> you know, um, because you express the immune system, it can't fight against infections. So it tells you in the after the dancing actors <laughs> that tell you to take this drug, what they tell you is you, you have an increased risk of dying of infections, increased risk of getting cancer. The immune system is no longer competent. But boy, do they look happy in the ads, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. But uh, if they had to pay the bill, they wouldn't. <laughs> but unfortunately, the search up is... Anyway, well, my point being is that you're not going to get this kind of uh, objective opinion from the standard medical business because we know we learn nothing about diet except for a few biochemical formulas. Anyway, uh, that's what we talked about in terms of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, and that is in the um, October 4th, 2023 issue of the New York Times. All right, well, let's go on to this one. Just, I really had a lot of fun with this one. This is from JAMA Surgery. And by the way, I've had one of my, from my friends and colleagues ask me, why are you reading surgery journals? You know, you're, you're an internist. Why do you, you know, why do you read oncology journals? It's because I love to read scientific journals. You know, it may not be something commonly done, but I have a passion for this kind of reading and research. And so, Anyway, I, I was I was browsing through in one of my 13 journals or more. I was browsing through uh, JAMA Surgery, which uh, the, the issue was October 4th, 2023. And what they talked about is taking care of women who have breast cancer. You should be interested. One in six of you women will deal with this particular problem. Uh, there is uh, a condition called BRCA, but you don't know what BRCA stands for. No, I don't, but I've heard it many oh, you've times. You've heard it many times. And, you know, I, I, I didn't until recently stop to figure out what in the heck are they talking about? BRCA1, BRCA, breast, B-R, yeah. cancer, C-A. Oh. Stupid, simple, right? Yeah. Okay. So a certain percentage of the population has has this tendency to more likely get breast, prostate, uh, colon, uh, ovary cancers, all kinds of cancer that have more risk. And they can tell us from a blood test? Yeah, they can tell, they do a genetic test and they can tell if you have the BRCA1 or, or what do you think the BRCA2 the BRCA gene is? It's the second gene discovered for BRCA. So, so they have... got two genes. They got two genes. Okay. So... Now, how do you tell you got these genes? Well, you could be. Um... Wait a minute. Is one worse than the other? Watch out, BRCA one. Is, is faster growing? Yeah, or... yeah. Okay. They don't do as well as. All right. uh, but anyways, there's. You can you say say say, say with say with that word Ashkenja. Ashkenzi. Anyway, Ashkenzi. A, a, yeah. a, a segment of the Jewish population, I believe they're mostly around the, around the Mediterranean, they have a higher risk of this. If you have a, uh, a mother or dad that has the BRCA gene, because it's a dominant gene and it's passed on from your mom and dad, you have a 50% chance of getting the gene. Now, how would you tell somebody, why would you go looking for a BRCA, the BRCA the genes in, in uh, you know, the BRCA1 or BRCA2 and somebody who came to you with, with breast cancer? Well, it would be an aggressive breast cancer, they'd be young. 
they'd have maybe this family history. And uh, that, that's that's the way you tell. And it, you would also have in combination ovary cancer, which brings me to the point of pulling this article. And it's something I've talked to you before. And that is that estrogen, which is produced by the ovaries, will, will determine the rapidity of growth of the breast cancer and the uh, likelihood of dying sooner. Estrogen does that. So estrogen is made by the ovaries. And in these studies where they take, uh, they do prophylactic mastectomies, and it's recommended if you have this BRCA gene that you have, you're both breast removed. There's no survival benefit to taking the breasts off. You only get the survival benefit when you take the ovaries out because this is an estrogen dependent tumor. Okay, how do you raise estrogen as well? Be a woman, you know, women have much more estrogen than men. You could take estrogen pills. You can eat the rich Western diet, which raises estrogen from a multitude of reasons. You can become obese, overweight, and your fat cells make estrogen. So, you know, it can come from diet, it can come from pills. Uh, uh, regardless, we're talking about a, a hormone made by the ovaries. And when you cut those ovaries out, you reduce the estrogen, as is something I recommend for women who just have breast cancer, not just BRCA1 or BRCA2. You consider taking your ovaries out. You survive much longer, a lot longer, like 60% longer. Anyways, it makes a huge difference. So, but you can leave your breasts. I guess that's the point I was coming to. You know, you're taking your breasts off isn't going to reduce your chance of dying. And that's what this paper says, October 4th, 2023. It's called Prophylactic Salpingo Oophorectomy and Survival from BRCA1 to Breast Cancer Resection. Doesn't work to take the breasts off. Stop doing it. Take the ovaries off. Give them tamoxifen. Give them aromatase the inhibitors. Cause them to lose weight. Reduces estrogens. Take them off any estrogen pills they're on. Feed them a starch-based diet, which cuts the estrogen production in a woman's body in half. Yeah, you read... Uh, you read... Uh, McDougall's Medicine, a challenge, second opinion, the chapter on breast cancer, which I published in 1984, says all that. <laughs> yes, it does. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, Kather, can I go on? Uh, there was a, a article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association called The Risk of Ozempic. They didn't really name Ozempic and Wygovi. And what's the other one? Monjaro. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, there's this, these, these new derivatives of Gila monster poison. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a reptile in the southwest United States called a Gila monster. And that Gila monster, when you get bit, it makes you sick, big surprise. And when you get sick, you get nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, and you don't want to eat. So what they've done is they've taken this Gila monster venom. They're called uh, glucagon-like uh, protein inhibitors, that are actually like one and agonists, uh, glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist, that's what they're called. Let me try that one more time. Glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist, GLP-1 oh, agonist, okay? Yeah, that's okay. what it stands for. Any, anyway, uh, you know, I told you the way they work. You know, you buy these medicines for like a thousand bucks a month. You shoot yourself, you know, once or twice a day or once a week, depending upon the variety you get, or you can take a pill. They have pills that do that. And you get so sick, you can't eat. You get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you can't eat. You lose your appetite. Well, this only works for a while. And we talked about this last week, how there's plateaus, which was talked about in the New York Times, about how rich people reach plateaus. Finally, the suppression of the appetite uh, matches the need for the body to survive. And it finally gets to the point where I don't care if you're sick or not, you're going to eat or you're going to die. <laughs> So you stop losing weight at somewhere between 27 and 38 pounds. All right. That's the plateau. Depends on whose paper you read. That's it. You lose no more weight. And once you stop the drug, the weight comes back. Okay. But, but these are the minor sicknesses that it causes. Uh, 
there are major sicknesses it causes, which is what this article in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association published October 5th, 2023 says, is you have a dramatic increase in risk of pancreatitis, which could kill you. Bowel obstruction, could die from that too. <laughs> Gastroparesis or paral paralysis of the gut, probably not going to die from that, but you're going to be plenty sick. Anyway, <laughs> these days. Would you pay good money to make yourself sick? I don't think so. Not if you knew better. Not if you stopped and realized there are no, there. I'm talking about billions of people. There are no overweight people who eat a starch-based diet and they're not hungry. They don't take Ozempic. They don't go on low-carb diets. They don't exercise heavily. They just eat rice and corn and potatoes and sweet potatoes. They avoid oil and animal foods. That's all. That's simple. All right, you want to go on, Heather? Okay, okay. Here, here's one today. I got this out of today's paper. I bet you haven't seen this one. Oh, Kevlin oh. Caputo. They're trying to beat the two-hour record for marathons. This guy is about to do it. He's just a few seconds off, and he ran the Chicago Marathon uh, yesterday, and he got uh, did it in two hours and you know, a hundredth of a minute. Yeah. Boy, he was fast. He's Kenyan. Kenyans and Ethiopians win all these races. You know why they win these races? Do you know why they win these races? Because they're well. They're fit. They have the, the best source of energy possible. They live on ugali, which is a porridge made of corn. 80% of their diet is corn. That's what winners eat. They eat starch-based diets. So, you know, if you're chasing a two-year-old around, or you're running a marathon or whatever you're doing, listen to this man. He's from Kenya. He won. All right. How am I doing? That was him. Calvin, no. Calvin Kipton. Well, he's good. I mean, he's from Kenya. Kenya. Corn. <laughs> Winners. <laughs> losers eat meat. <laughs> losers, really losers eat these keto diets or these carnivore diets. They're, they're, they're like in yesterday's finishers for the marathon. They come in tomorrow. Anyway, <clears throat> see, do I have anything else? Oh, yeah, the Washington Post. Uh, and that was, uh, so the Washington Post article came up. The Washington Post article, that was October 4th. Uh, they said that being a, ve a vegan, vegetarian, was determined by your genes. Boy, I, I tell you, I've, I've heard heart disease and high blood pressure and diabetes and obesity and cancer. I've heard these things are caused by genes my whole career, which of course puts me in a situation where as a doctor, I can't help you because I can't change genes. And neither can you, even if it's true, but it's not true. You know, they tell us that 6% of the population in our country, the United States, has decided to be somewhat of a vegan or vegetarian. They got the gene. The vegetarian gene. Kitty. No, I'm serious. <laughs> this is came out in today's paper. Uh, let's see, where did it come out? It came out in the Washington Post, October 4th, 2020. Oh, okay. October 4th, yeah. Excuse me. It's like, you know, there are like <laughs> two billion Asians, two billion Asians who before 1980 suffered no diabetes. They must have all had the gene because they <laughs> ate a vegan, vegetarian, starch-based diet. And maybe a little meat in there here and there, but over 90% of the diet was rice. So obviously they got a genetic issue, right? Uh, you know, this is terrible. You know, to tell people that they're, that they're condemned by their genes. You're not condemned by your genes. I think that's covered. Oh, one more. October 3rd, uh, New York Times discussed insulin resistance and told you that that's the problem. The problem is an insulin resistance. We talked about this. Insulin resistance is a normal adaptation that occurs to prevent you from becoming morbidly obese. You know, it, obese, like 35% of the people are obese in the United States. Didn't I just tell you that? Yeah. No, I, and, and they say in some populations, like in the Southeast, 40% are obese. No, they're just trying to prevent the development of insulin resistance is just prevent them from going obese, which is a BMI of 
In other words, 30% of your body's fat to be going to a morbid obese, which 40% of your body is fat. And, and that's what that resistance is supposed to do. It's an adaptation. And when you lose the weight, you have no longer the need for the adaptation because you're, you're trim. And so the resistance disappears. I think, I think you folks should go back and listen to my lectures on cancer, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. They're, they're all on YouTube in a somewhat rough form. If you want them in a clean, really well put together form, I just recorded. I recorded five two-hour lectures on each of these subjects. They're the best I'm ever going to do. They are discussions that are titled McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. And it'll, it'll bring you up to date on the things I just told you about. And all of these issues, insulin resistance, the power of estrogen to promote cancer and cancer death. You know, this is all discussed in a book I wrote in 1984, published in 84, wrote it in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. All right, Heather, that, did I overdo it? Did I do too many news, news things? I don't think so. I'm just amazed that that much came out in one week. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the truth is the truth is the truth. They got nothing else to tell but the truth. They just put their spin on it. So, you, you know, if I look up in the New York Times, look up on di articles on type 2 diabetes, that'd be six or eight articles, but they all say the same thing. But they put their little spin on it and blame it something like your genes. Uh, you, you know, you, you come from a, a, bad, a bad ethnic background, you know, you're lazy, all kinds of silly stuff. They, but they never talk about the food. The food's the problem. Any of you who are pet owners, try it. Try, try feeding your parrot pork chops. <laughs> okay, try feeding your cat rice casseroles for the week. You think it would make a difference? Well, if you're going to feed the, the rich Western diet, which, you know, if you fed it to your animals, you get arrested for animal abuse. Yeah, you get arrested. But you can get away from feeding a deadly, damaging diet to your children, and they don't even comment. Well, well. All right, Heather, I'm done. <laughs> okay, that was great. Thank you for bringing all that up. Lots and lots of questions coming in to the chat and also ones that people emailed me, so I can't get to them all, but I'll do my best. Okay, this is from Tessa Jane. She wants to know if you recommend colonics. Well, you know, it's a good question. I've dealt with colonics my whole career, Heather. You know, every, you got to remember, I I, I started seeing patients in 1978, and I was in Kailua, Hawaii, which is kind of the hippie capital of the world. <laughs> and uh, so we had a lot of alternative medicine practices. And, you know, we'd go to fairs and they'd see these crystal balls and, you know, all these, uh, these scents that you could burn in the air and that would cure something or other. I don't know what. Anyway, so colonics is something I was confronted with almost on a daily basis. And uh, I had a good chance to talk to many people and know people who did do did colon, colon, colonoscopy therapy. They're called therapists. <laughs> yeah, not 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 colonoscopy though. No, no. It's not uh, uh, There are colon therapy. High col colonics. High, high colonics. High That's colonics. What, yeah, I know people who did high colonics. Yeah, not colonoscopy, of course not. Maybe maybe they're similar. What do you think? Maybe maybe both of them, you stick a tube of somebody's butt and you charge them a lot of money and nothing beneficial happens. That's why they're the same. They're the same. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you know, you know, the the first study randomized controlled trial ever published involved 85,000 people. It was published October 22nd, 2022 in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first randomized trial on colonoscopy. They, they studied 58, 85,000 people. Some got colonoscopies as recommended, some didn't. At the end of 10 years, there was no, 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 no difference in survival. All right, so. Well, we, we don't, don't want to confuse the question because it's about colonoscopy. We don't colonoscopy. want to send anybody colonoscopies, no. But, but uh, colon therapy, what'd you call it? High colonics. High colonics. Thank you. High colonics is uh, 
but it's probably more beneficial. It's less harmful and costs you less money. So anyway, what, what we do, you want to argue about this? Come on now. Come on, you guys, you GI specialists. Let's argue maybe, it. Maybe people don't even know what it is. I'll, I'll start at the beginning like I should have. Yeah. Okay. What we're talking about is you go see a colon therapist and the treatment is, they say death begins in the colon. And they talk about how there's these layers of sludge through de years, decades of eating the hell and healthy American diet. you got like a half an inch of sludge built up in your colon, they say. And so what they do is they stick this to way high, high colonics, way high up into the colon, and they pump water in there. Okay. so uh, Like an enema. Yeah, like an enema, except they got another tube. The other tube has a plastic area in it where you can see the stuff that's being washed out. Okay, so they got water flushing in. They got this drainage tube carrying the water out. Well, you have a chance to view. And you see this stuff coming out of your butt that you never saw before because it's taking material that's undigested from the high part of the colon. And so all these chunks of stuff come out and the therapist says to you, oh, this is the sludge you've been collecting for decades in your colon, and we're going to wash it out and cure you. Well, <laughs> look, you know, I, I've told a lot of you that I put myself through medical school as a uh, an operating room nurse. I was a surgical technician. That means every day, you know, six, eight, ten times a day, I would be involved in major surgeries. And probably half those times I was in the abdomen. I have seen hundreds of colons inside of them, and I've never seen one covered with sludge. <laughs> it never happens. Anyway, the colonics, high colonics became popular, I think, because of something normal, normal and physiologic. And that is a bowel movement feels good. Just a regular old bowel movement feels good. Can you imagine what a huge bowel movement feels like? <laughs> it feels really good. So anyways, you leave like maybe four or five pounds lighter from all the garbage <laughs> crap getting pulled out of your colon. Oh. And you feel good for a few minutes. And I'll tell you, there's a good thing that, uh, that high colonics do. The people who administer them are more interested in diet than the general population. So in general, they'll send you on to a healthier diet. But as far as high colonics uh, being the answer to disease, ladies and gentlemen, the way you clean your colon is you put good stuff in and it just naturally cleanses itself. That's all. <laughs> What's good stuff? Starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils. What's bad stuff? Animal foods and oils. That's right. So uh, next question, Heather. Did I answer that question? Yeah, perfect. All more right. than we wanted to know, but that was great. Probably, probably, probably more than they wanted to know. But the nice thing is, is there are people listening, Heather. Can you believe that? Oh, and they even, love this. They love your very thorough answers. So thank and, you. And, and Heather, they, 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 some of the people out there are actually fact-checking me to see whether I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I'm waiting to hear that I've exaggerated, please. I mean, the <laughs> fiction is so much more wild than the truth. Or the truth is so the much truth, more wild. Yeah. It just... Uh, the truth is the truth is scarier than the fiction, I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't have to exaggerate. Absolutely. I don't even have to put a bad spin on it. You guys know you're overweight and sick. <laughs> you know your friends and relatives are not thriving. <laughs> yeah, Heather, I, I watch uh, you know, I watch television commercials and when we go out, you know, we see people on the streets. You know, we're, we see a whole population of people down in a park not too far from us. They're overweight. This is normal. I, it's unusual these days. In fact, I know what the statistics are. I just told you. Only 20% of the people are considered trim. The other 80% are either obese, which is 35 to 40% obese. In other words, uh, uh, greater than 30% BMI. And, and, and the rest of them, the other 40% the other are overweight. All right, you ready for next question? <laughs> it's from Jill, and she's wanting you to explain the potato reset. Boy, that's a good one. Look that one up. Potato I, I reset. What the potato reset is. I so, like it. Somebody must have made I, it. I like it, though. I like it. Based though. on our, our... I was thinking it must be something like Mary's Mini. Yeah, uh, let's see. Well, you know, it's, it's it like... potatoes. <laughs> 
is people ask me about a fast. And I do recommend you go to a place like True North and get a, the ultimate in the elimination diet. The lowest yeah. cholesterol, lowest fat diet you can possibly get is water fast. Potato reset rules. All right. Okay, the potato reset plan includes all varieties of potatoes. Like that. Yeah. Sweet potatoes, yams, non-starchy vegetables, spices, and plant-based sauces. No other starchy foods are allowed. No corn, bean, beans, rice, or grains. You Some can have as many star non-starchy vegetables as you like. I would support that. But, but I think the reset thing is kind of like when you go for a water fast is, you know, they could serve you bread and water. You'd think it was the best meal you ever had after two or three days of water fasting. So if all you had was potatoes, if we opened up the recipe book to, you know, two or 3,000 other recipes, you, you would think that you went to heaven. Oh, here's, here's the explanation. Uh, the potato reset is a short-term plan to help you reset your taste buds and lose weight in the process. What did I just say? The potato reset is also a way to ease into a whole food plant-based diet. I like it. <laughs> but, but a couple of precautions there. One is you cannot eat the same amount of food that you used to eat. You know, potatoes are so low in calories. They're so satisfying. You'll become satiated. You may not get in enough calories for your activities or to maintain the weight you want to have. And, uh, you know, therefore, because there's no limit on how much you can eat, they say you can eat as many as you want. So. But, you know, people in the American diet have been so uh, lacking in satiety. When they finally get around to a potato, they go, oh, this feels so good. I never felt this way before. Well, maybe I don't have to eat so much. And then they end up losing too much weight. Oh, you know. I think that's it's in the okay. potato. The potato is the lowest calorie, one of the lowest calorie starches. You know, uh, you see my stomach stomach demo. You know, you can't even fill a, the size of the stomach with potatoes and match the 500 calories that I tell you is in the stomach. You have to put extra potatoes on the side. You know, if you only put 400 calories of potatoes in your stomach because they're so bulky, and the carbohydrate they have is is a very powerful, powerful substance that satisfies your hunger okay the caution you got to eat enough potatoes don't go dieting now and uh, don't put anything on the potatoes that's what i said yeah you can't do that don't put bacon and, and yeah. butter and cheese on them <laughs> can't do that you can put a little salt a little barbecue sauce that'd be okay but they probably don't allow it that's why mcdougall isn't very strict I think they copied it from Mary's Mini. Probably. We only wrote that 20 years ago. <laughs> and here we have articles for the past week that are basically what I've been telling you for 40 years. Nothing's changed. The truth don't change. Thank you. Okay, next question. Can you talk about whether nuts are good for treating dementia or Alzheimer's disease in the long run? Well, I suspect, Heather, this comes back to the supplement sellers. Uh, you know, people who uh, uh, comment on a low-fat diet, they say there's not as enough essential fat in a low-fat diet. Starch-based diet, like we recommend. It's got loads of fat. You know, there's no such thing as fatty acid deficiency. There's no such thing as a deficiency of essential fatty acids eating a starch-based diet. So... Um, where are we going with that? Whether you need to eat nuts to help. Oh, you eat nuts. Oh, okay. For, for I, was telling, I was telling you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was getting on to supplement salespeople. So what they do is they sell you these essential fats in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, such as EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, and DHA. And so they're trying to sell you supplements by telling you that you, um, okay, short of that, of selling you these essential fats, they say, well, you can get these essential fats from nuts and seeds, and you can, but you can also get it from corn and potatoes and rice. And who's to say the kind of essential fats from say uh, beans or sweet potatoes or corn are just as effective as the essential fats you'd get from nuts and seeds and just as effective as you'd get from the supplements they're trying to sell you. Well, yeah. but isn't there a rumor 
or something going around that as you age, you you aren't able to absorb these proteins and fats. Is that all okay. proteins and oh, okay. That's I, mean, what, I thought I that's, thought it was just the nuts and seed or the um the fat, essential fat, fat. Uh, essential fat. Well, yes, that's one of the sales pitches of the supplement people. They oh, say okay. as you get older. I mean, you didn't need your supplement when you were in your, you didn't need to buy my supplement when you're in your twenties. But now that all you people are in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, I'm going to really, really sell you the stuff. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, sarcopenia, you don't eat enough protein. Don't buy my protein supplements. You're going to get muscle wasting. And you don't take buy my DHA and EPA, you're going to get dementia. But the research says that ain't true. No, it's not true. But it's it's a great business, I guess. So that's where I think it comes from, Heather. And I'm sorry I went on such a long road to get to. <laughs> this came about because of supplement salespeople. But you've got to consider populations of millions, if not billions of people have lived on diets without nuts and seeds. And they develop normal brains. They have children. They build universities. They do just fine. You know, so once you get enough of a certain nutrient, getting more doesn't help. In fact, it actually hurts because then you've got to deal with the excess. Like in the case of excess protein, it damages your liver and kidneys. It damages your bones, causes kidney stones. So you don't want to overdo it. Excess of fat like nuts and seeds. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. You take these supplements, even though it's just a tiny bit of oil, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. It all adds up. So no, you don't need to eat nuts and seeds. And if you want to lose weight, you better not. If you want to gain weight, you might. I've been trying. <laughs> I've been trying for, I haven't found eating nuts and seeds very effective for gaining weight, but you might. I think most people do, I think. I mean, that's what you keep telling me, Heather. But you, you know, just to repeat myself, I have at least 400 calories of almonds for breakfast. And I have at least, not every day, 400 calories of mixed nuts. That's 800 calories of fat. Obesity causing fat. Why am I not gaining weight? I'm probably going to have to find somebody else to tell me. What you I, I know what will do it. Pepperoni pizza. <laughs> And it's washed down with a half a bottle of whiskey. That'll do it. We're not trying that. I'm not doing that again. Okay. That'll All clog right. your arteries too. So we yeah. don't want that. No, we're not trying that one. All right, we're not doing that one. So you do your own experiments, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, next question. This is from Colleen. She's wondering if you had a full hysterectomy due to endometrial cancer, do you think the cancer could come back? Oh, uh, you know. It could. Uh, the, 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 the thing is, is that, first of all, I think it's my October 2011 newsletter. It's uh, about abusive medical doctors. Read it. It's about uterine cancer, October 2011 newsletter about abusive doctors. OK, you, or you can find them going to hot topics, colon cancer, cancers. And it's one of the four or five articles that's there. And it talks to you about one of my patients who had uterine cancer, an early stage of uterine cancer, but two of her specialists had uh, forced her to consider a, a hysterectomy. She didn't want to have a hysterectomy for a whole variety of reasons we can get into someday, but she didn't want to go through the surgery. So she asked me, is, if you avoid surgery, would she increase her chances of dying of, of uh, uterine cancer? And I said, probably not. But there's no evidence that says it will. Well, one of her doctors got mad at me, and she was a really crude cancer <laughs> specialist. And we had a, 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 a bit of a word fight. She sounded like a drunken sailor outside of a bar swearing at me. But anyway, we, um, uh, we came to an agreement, and that is that uh, I would look over any evidence she had that said that surgery would reduce the risk of dying of somebody with uterine cancer. Just give me the research. I mean, you you ladies and gentlemen are doing this operation. You've probably done a million of them over the last 50 years. I've been watching you. You tell me you haven't studied and showed it works? No, they haven't. So to answer your question, to get to the bottom line is, 
Uh, nobody knows. Nobody studied it. But what I do know is they have no evidence that says removing your uterus will cause you to live longer. Ask them for the study. The study. One study. One randomized control trial. <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> they don't have it. Anyway, uh, the bottom line was this woman has not to this day, it's been 20 years, had her uterus removed. And uh, she'd been through two gynecologists that insisted she'd be dead if she didn't. But they don't have any she's evidence. Still not, she's, she's still doing fine. fine. But, but I don't know the answer. But I do know, based on the natural history of cancer, that, well, n- number one is that it's often slow growing and you'll die of something else. And number two, if you eat a good diet, you'll slow the growth of the cancer. Uterine cancer, cancer of the body of the uterus is caused by the Western diet. It's another one of those estrogen things that we talked about at the beginning of this show. Estrogen stimulates the uterus, the inside lining called the endometrium and the muscular part, the fibrous part of the uterus It stimulates. You get fibroid tumors. So what I would recommend anybody who asks me these questions is, First of all, talk to the real doctors, ask them for the evidence, see if they can provide it. If they can't, then you're left with the problem I have, not knowing what to do because there's no research to show it. But I do understand the natural history of cancer. And I do know that by the time something really becomes cancerous and spreads, it's been growing for a long time. So if it's truly the kind of cancer that's spread, it's already spread by the time they take the uterus out or the breast or the prostate or the lung, it's already spread. Okay. The second thing I know is you can change the rate of growth of various cancers with a good diet. That's clearly you can do that. Because of the doubling time. Yep, that's right. Doubling time. So you've been listening to me. I've been listening, yeah. 50, see what 50 years of listening to me. <laughs> really? to. Anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's often easier to go with the crowd. And if you want to make everybody happy, mother-in-law, your doctors, et cetera, Have your uterus out. But if you want to do care for yourself based upon the science, then don't do that without careful consideration and asking for the evidence. I've given you the science. I've given you the rationale. Well, this person said she already had her uterus removed. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so she was wondering if the cancer would come back. Could. Because. Could, but the chance of it coming back is much, much less if you eat a good diet. Right. So, you know, if the chances of me at 76 year old having a massive heart attack are not zero, or it could happen. But the fact that I've been eating well for, well, since 1977, makes the risk of that extremely small. You know, I, I'm gonna die of old age. It's interesting because, you know, I never, I never worry about you dying of a heart attack. I mean, it's one of the things that, you know, why when people get to be our age, I suppose they think about this, but it's something I never even think about. It's because you've lived with me and I've continued to keep moving. <laughs> I guess so. You know, I, 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 it's, uh, it's just something never yeah, but even see, you, you, Except for the fact that, you know, I went through a radical change at around age 28. Yeah. yeah but, but but my previous history, I mean, at age 22, I had a cholesterol 338. 338. Don't start worrying me now. (laughs) I had a stroke at 18. Good grief. If we wouldn't have had the fortune of gaining this knowledge, Mary, I'd have been dead. I'd have never made it to 76. I'd have had a bunch of heart surgeries and brain surgeries and probably gastric bypass surgery. I'd be an ozempic patient. Have been on well, pain pills. Be a doctor, so you wouldn't know all this stuff. So you just listen to, listen to whatever they were telling you, and die, and who knows what would happen to die, you? Die in ignorance, which is most people have been relegated to do. You die <laughs> without knowing. You know, you think it's your genes. Well, you can't do anything about your genes. You think it's bad luck. Well, what can you do about bad luck? You think it's the wrath of God. Well, what are you going to do if it's the wrath of God? Oh, come on, folks. You, a lot of you out there have been. Anyway, next question. Okay, thank you. This is from Jeannie. She's 74 years old, and she's been following the McDougal program for 25 years. However, she just had a compression fracture, 
nothing. She didn't really do anything. It just happened. Mm -hmm. And so her doctors are telling her she has osteopenia, osteoporosis, and she needs to start eating a lot of protein. She's scared and wants to know what you would recommend. Well, that's the opposite of the truth, what the research says. A high protein diets, particularly animal protein, uh, are very acidic acid. They deliver an acid load to the body, which dissolves the bones, which gives you osteoporosis. The, the way to, well, first of all, let me, let me start out by saying, you know, uh, pr prior to 25 years, you were probably like me, you probably ate with abandonment. Anything that would fit between your lips, you ate. And you finally got wisdom at age 25. Well, you know, these things have a way of kind of catching up with you, even though bone loss is reversible. Uh, but the idea to eat protein is uh, is foolish. Uh, it's based on faulty research. I know the research that says so. And these people who recommend these protein, uh, higher protein in the diet, many of them work for the meat and dairy industry. I've searched them down. I know this. Anyway, the way to keep your bones strong is safe exercise. You don't want to get hit by a car. You don't want to test your bone strength by you know falling off your bicycle. Safe exercise, sunshine to make sure you get plenty of vitamin D and to eat a starch-based diet. And that's the best way to keep the bone strong. Now, as far as medications go, what I would use, and you've heard me talk about this, you can find it in McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion, published in 1984. I still make the same recommendations. You can take antacids, which neutralize the dietary acids. And I would seriously consider doing this. And acids like Tums or sodium bicarb or magnesium, milk and magnesia, and, and acids, they neutralize the acid from the meat and that way keep your bones intact. So, you know, you take a couple of Tums a day. The calcium part doesn't matter. It's just the antacid part. And then the next thing you do is you take estrogen. In addition to estrogen promoting various kinds of cancers like breast and uterus, Estrogen promotes bone growth, always. So in my book, The McDougal Program for Women, chapter 13 on hormone replacement therapy, I tell you how to use estrogens the safest way I know, which is use them as skin creams. So getting down to what I would recommend, I wouldn't recommend the bisphosphonates. They're dangerous. They cause necrosis of the jaw. Many oral surgeons won't see patients on bisphosphonates like Aldenet, Aldenet. Uh, what's, what's some of the other ones? I don't know any of them. You can look them up, bisphosphonates. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, you don't want to do that. There's also uh, uh, a derivative of fish eggs, calcitonin, which you can spray up your nose. Not very effective. Uh, let's see what else they recommend. No, I'll probably a few other drugs out there. Uh, Fosamax is what I was trying to think oh, of. Mary. Uh, this phosphate is phosphate. You know, they don't advertise those things anymore. They used to. You know why? Because they don't work? No, because they don't make any money off of them. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's why. You see, you go from uh, uh, you go from something that has a trademark, you know, that you own the copyright on, the trademark on, and you, you, you sell this at as much expense as the public will pay. All the market, all the market will bear. So you come out with new diabetic drugs, new blood pressure drugs, new osteoporosis drugs, and that's where the money is because you own the patent, all right? When they go out of patent, then other drug companies come in and they make a cheaper version, just as effective. So what do the drug companies do, the big ones? They stop advertising the drug that just went generic, even though it may be a great drug. There are, there are so many great, great drugs that have been relegated off the marketplace, out of the care of the general doctor because of money. You know, like for example, with atrial fibrillation, you know, I've always treated it with, with digoxin, which is from the foxglove plant, the digitalis comes from a plant, slows the heart rate, strengthens the, strengthens the heart muscle. When uh, calcium channel blockers came out and they thought that there might be a benefit to, for atrial fibrillation with calcium channel blockers, guess what? No longer were you supposed to prescribe digoxin. In fact, they got their spin doctors out and talked about all the negative effects of digitalis for treating atrial fib because they had a new drug that was 
that was highly profitable for them. But see, in addition to get the new drug in the, in the customer's mind, you got to take the old drug out of their minds. So anyway, you get you walk around a little bit safely, you get a little sunshine, you get the acid out of your diet. You may want to reduce your intake of beans, peas, lentils, because they're high in vegetable protein. And vegetable protein can cause calcium and bone loss, not just animal. Animals are really destructive. And, uh, and then as a, a next step, you've got sunshine, you walk carefully, you're eating a good diet now. The next thing you do is you try some antacids like Tums or any kind of antacid. And then you go on to hormone replacement therapy. That's the best I know. The other drugs are too toxic, too expensive, too many side effects, too ineffective. They're not good drugs. They, they don't beat diet and lifestyle, diet and exercise and sunshine, but they never do. That's the problem because these drugs are not, are not the problem. Drug deficiency is not why you're sick. You're sick from food poisoning. You can't cover up the adverse effects of food poisoning with a bunch of drugs, but we try. You know, we try, we make the signs go away. We make the blood pressure lower and the cholesterol lower. Yeah, we do. But you still die of strokes and heart attacks at the same rate because we haven't dealt with the problem. All we did is fix the numbers. All right, Heather. Thank you. <laughs> uh, lots of questions coming in about what you guys eat in a typical day. What's your breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Well, did you well, some new recipes? I, I did, but that no, doesn't no. really have anything to do with what we eat on a typical oh, day. I know, but it kind of gave you an introduction to tell them about the new things that you found this week. I'll oh, go, go ahead. You tell them what well, to eat. Breakfast is, is the same every day. This is my breakfast man right here. I make, I make breakfast. He makes oatmeal. Every day. Every morning. Without fail, or we don't have breakfast. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not my job anymore. I... That's his job. Yeah, you read the newspaper and relax and yeah. get comfortable. And, <laughs> and, I make. and then I get served breakfast. Yeah, I do that. Um, for lunch, we usually have leftovers from the night before. Almost always. Yeah. And for dinner, we kind of rotate through. We have one night when, when I make a big pot of beans and we have bean burritos. Um, tonight, we're having a, um, baked potatoes that will... I'll probably make green beans or broccoli or something to go with it. So we'll have a whole, that's all we'll have is just a ton of baked potatoes. And let me add a note in here. Is Heather's son <laughs> spends a lot of time with us. And he's not going back to school until he has his baked potato dinner. <laughs> that just shows you how good the food is. But you keep well, it simple. That's all you eat is baked potatoes and and uh, beans. Let's see. No, no, what else? How about all those great soups and bread? Oh, bread? well, I always make a, a white bean soup at least once a week. I start with small white beans, and then every week I make it different. I add onions. I add tomatoes. I add spinach. I add different spices so it tastes different all the it's time. It's always good. You could serve a hardcore <laughs> carnivore Mary's bean soups with bread, and they'd say, bring it on. I want this food. It's really good. And well, we I'm gonna have split pea soup a lot because it, it's one of the things the, the grandkids rec, uh request a lot. They do. Um not, not my favorite. I know it's not your favorite. When we have a um the only time I ever make lasagna is when we're gonna have a family, a big family gathering. Well, I don't do it for for John and I. We John and I eat really quite simply you know just simple bean dishes and and potatoes and uh, and soups and let's see what else the japanese rice dish you know, oh, two yeah. nights ago oh i mean i i wanted it for lunch the next day and the next day i wanted it for lunch again that is really it's a japanese sauce yeah well i, I use that Jap japanese um japanese barbecue sauce Heather knows um, what oh, I mean. The napkins? Yeah. Yeah. And I use that as my seasoning, but I start out with a pan of um, mixed frozen stir-fry vegetables. And I cook those. Then I add some baked tofu squares that I bake until they're crunchy. And then I add 
rice, cooked rice. But you might as well tell them, Mary, where you get the brown rice from. Or I'm going to tell them. What do you mean, I, where I get the brown well, rice? Well, you from? don't bring out your rice cooker and cook oh, it. Oh, no, I get my brown rice from the freezer. <laughs> don't you? <laughs> uh, it used to be, you know, you couldn't find yeah. brown rice anywhere. But now, almost every store has frozen brown rice, frozen quinoa, um, all kinds of grains that are already cooked and frozen. So it makes it really easy to cook. Mm -hmm. And we usually have one night of sweet potatoes. Yeah, and yeah, broccoli. And broccoli. Um, so just very simple things. You know, you're, you're, you're repetitive in your eating too. You just might not realize it. Uh, you eat the same thing over and over again. I mean, think about it. Before you learned a starch-based meal plan, when you're eating the American diet, you had the same thing for breakfast every day. Bacon and eggs, it might have been. You had the same things for lunch and dinner. And every time you went to a restaurant, at that particular restaurant, you order the same item off the menu every time. You're boring. You're monotonous. <laughs> People don't like a lot of variety, or at least they don't have to. Probably they shouldn't. But if you do, Mary's published over 4,000 recipes. It's just, just pick a few things you like. Yeah, find a few favorite things and just keep repeating them. And then when you find something new, which is what I can talk about now. I found this recipe. Um, it was in the New York Times, and it was uh, I kept it because it was something that I would never make. But it's called creamy vegan tofu noodles. Okay, and the noodles and everything are okay. But then you use tofu, and um, but then you add. Let's see what else. Well, they use uh, white sesame seeds. Well, that'd be okay. Yeah. A couple of tablespoons, teaspoons of olive oil. Sesame oil, that's not okay. Yeah. A few seeds would be all right. Mm. You know, your, your, your creamy vegan noodle dishes are really good, Mary. Yeah, I guess. Well, there's really not much one, you could. This one is is one I wouldn't have to change a whole lot. Maybe we'll try, maybe we'll try it. But, but, but I think the problem was there weren't enough vegetables in it. Mm. It was just a... Uh, um, noodles and then the tofu that you um right. stirred up in the pan and you put it over the noodles and, and to me it was just like that sounds boring okay so if i made it i would take the recipe and make the noodles and the tofu and add the tofu to the noodles and then i would add the right amount of vegetables the right amount of vegetables see, see she's talking about green and yellow vegetables like celery broccoli and cauliflower which some people out there they think this is just supposed to be your diet is these nutrient dense non-starchy green and yellow vegetables you'll starve to death <laughs> and i was just about to say before you, you mentioned your combination there i was going to say well make sure you eat enough noodles <laughs> <laughs> noodles are starch they're wheat now of course you can get noodles made with eggs and oils and dairy and all kinds of things so you got to look at the label and most noodles are clean. Thank you. Lots of great ideas, but keep it simple. And eat when you're hungry and until you're comfortably full. And just uh, let's see. Oh. You know, you don't have to have a great variety. Just find two or three or four or five things you like and eat them over and over again. Make, make it real simple for you. And Shaw wants to know what you think about the eating right for your blood type diet. Oh, uh, Diamino is his name. He's a chiropractor, actually from the Northwest. D Diamino, D apostrophe A M I N O, something like that. Anyway, it's been like twenty or thirty years since I've run across it. Like the shoe size diet. That uh, you, know, you told the end of the <laughs> joke, Mary. No, I tell me I have to. You have one minute, so you yeah you okay. get okay okay okay. The the the, the uh, blood type diet is based on the fact that. Asians have more commonly type A blood and whites, Caucasians have more commonly type O blood. Asians eat mostly rice and don't have heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Caucasians, whites eat mostly meat and dairy and they got these diseases. So, you know, what he did is he, he made an association which is not relevant. And so what I was going to do is I was gonna make my next book the shoe size diet. 
In other words, people who have small shoes, like people, Asian people, you know, they have small feet. Okay. Uh, they need to live on rice. And people who have big shoes, they need to leave, live on pork chops and cheese. <laughs> hey, you don't have to change what's on your plate. All you got to do is change your shoes. <laughs> you can't change your blood type. <laughs> All right. I'm done. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Oh, Heather, I want you to, I, I, you know, we're, we're just starting to promote this uh, five lecture series. It's 10 hours. And it really is. It's the culmination of 55 years of work I've done. And I'm really proud of it. So we have these tapes available for, for people. And uh, there'd be great things to buy your doctor for his or her birthday. And uh, Christmas. Christmas would be okay, too. You can even buy it for Halloween. Yes, you mm -hmm. can. Uh, anyway, well, we, we have this five series, and we're doing other lectures all the time. And then you got a program that's sold we out. A, we had a program starting Friday. Like next Friday, this this coming this, like yeah. six days from now, we have a good group of people from all over the world. You can be you can be halfway around the world, and you wouldn't even know it. You take care of you just like you were next door. Anyway, we run this telemedicine program. Uh, Doctor Lim will start seeing you tomorrow. If that's the case, oh no, because you can't get in. <laughs> <laughs> He'll start seeing you tomorrow for our January program. Mm -hmm. oh, anyway. Great. That was anyway. fun. Thanks for that hour, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Yeah. Bring your friends and relatives next Sunday, five o'clock Pacific time on YouTube channel. We'll be here. Thanks everyone for tuning in. See you all next Sunday. Take care. <laughs>